Hey, what's good, Rocky Peak? How are we doing this weekend? Hey, it is good to be with you once again, whether you're joining us inside the worship center, out on the patio, or joining us online. Welcome to Rocky Peak this weekend. In particular, if you are joining us for the very first time, special welcome to you. We're excited to have you with us this weekend as we dive into God's Word together. If you and I have not had a chance to meet, uh, my name is Dre. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Rocky Peak, and I get to lead us in that time of teaching right now. And so if you haven't done so yet, if you open up those programs, Inside, you're going to find that green and white message note sheet Trisha talked about. That's a great tool to help you follow along with this time of teaching. Also, it's a great tool to be able to jot down anything the Holy Spirit is specifically prompting you to remember during our time. I'm going to pray, and we're going to go ahead and dive right in. You know, Jesus, as I've watched that video a few times now this week, and I'm continually humbled and in awe by what you're doing around the world. Jesus, it's beautiful to remember that your work, your kingdom is not simply for one local church, not one state, not one nation, not even one hemisphere, but it is for all people. That the love of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus transcends all languages, all cultures, and all barriers. That this community we call the church truly is a global community, and I'm humbled to say that we are a part of it. And so Jesus, as together as your local church, as Rocky Peak, as we open up your word this weekend, which is living and active, We don't need to ask you to speak because you already are. As your people, we are committed to listening to what you have to say to us through it. As I often pray the words of John the Baptist, I pray that as the communicator, I would become much, much less and fall to the wayside this weekend. I pray that you, King Jesus, would become much, much more in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our lives, and in our actions. And it's in your name, King Jesus, that we all said, amen. Well, Rocky Peak, this weekend, we're going to be continuing this bigger series we've been in called Science. And if you're new or joining us for the first time, this has been an in-depth series in the life and teachings of Jesus. As seen through the eyes of one of Jesus' closest followers and friends, a man that we now call the Apostle John. And what John is doing through his gospel, he writes this as an older man, and he's looking back on his firsthand experiences with Jesus. And throughout the gospel of John, he is inviting each and every one of us to go on a journey with him to better understand who Jesus truly is and why Jesus really came. And so last week, Michael kicked off our second sub-series, if you will, in our study in John called Signs, the Path Forward. Now, we're gonna be in the sub-series between now through the end of the calendar year, but throughout the passages and scriptures we're gonna cover, it's only gonna take pl- it's only gonna cover a matter of hours in the life of Jesus and his followers. See, as Jesus is getting ready for his death on the cross, he's going to take this next several hours to intentionally prepare his followers for what to do in the aftermath of his death and resurrection. And so throughout this series, we're highlighting that he's not simply speaking to his original disciples, but he's speaking to his followers now that in the aftermath of the resurrection of Jesus, we are now a brand and new community that we call the church. And so as that new community, how are we now to live and move forward in light of what Jesus has done? And so last week, as Michael kicked this off, he laid the foundation on which this new community is built on. So there in the front of your note sheet, Like any good long-running television show, you see a previously in John chapter 13. If you were with us, you remember that Michael Michael walked us through Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And this was a radical, a paradigm shifting, a completely tangible act of God's love for his people, his grace and his mercy. And Michael laid the foundation for our time today is that it's in that. That, that that act, that love is the foundation for our community moving forward. There you see on your note sheet in John chapter 13, Jesus said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And then under that, Michael put it well last week that as followers of Jesus, we never leave this foundation 
If the mark of a true disciple is that we love as he loved us, that means picking up the basin and towel in humility and seeking each other's best. And so we're gonna continue to dive into that truth in our time this weekend. And so if you're following along your note sheet, you've got a section titled, A New Command. If you've got your Bibles, open them up. If you've got your apps, turn them on. We're gonna be going back to John chapter 13. And as we get ready to do so, Rocky Peak, what am I gonna tell you? We're gonna mark this up, so get yourself ready because it's gonna get beautifully messy. So we're gonna start at verse 17. We're gonna go right to where we left off last week. So after Jesus had washed the feet of his disciples, after he told them that this is now the example that we are to follow as his church, he says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And now as we close out our chapter together, this is immediately continuing that Passover gathering. And what's going to happen next is the rest of this chapter is going to be presented in two distinct episodes. The first one is going to be Jesus referring to his betrayal at the hands of Judas. And so as we jump to verse 18, I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. And so when talking about his betrayal, he quotes Psalm 41, in which David writes of the anguish of being betrayed by a close friend. As we continue in verse 19, I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Would you underline or highlight that? So I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Verse 20, very truly I tell you, if you remember, that's a powerful declaration of amen, amen. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. Would you underline or highlight that? Troubled in spirit and testified in a very official, almost like a legal proceeding way. Very truly I tell you, again, amen, amen, one of you is going to betray me. And so let's pause right there because there is actually a lot to unpack and so throughout our journey in John's gospel, Jesus has spoken about the fact that he was going to depart, that he would be handed over, that he would face death. And we've seen that that never went over well with the disciples. And throughout John's gospel, Jesus has begun to hint a little bit that something may be off with one of the 12. But as far as I can think or remember, this is the clearest. And in other words, this is the most blunt statement he has made that his his betrayal is going to be as the result of one of the 12. Now we're going to dig a little bit more into that in our passage together, but I want to draw your attention back to what I had you highlight and underline in verse 19. Jesus is saying that even though he is betrayed, this is happening under his authority. This is a declaration of God's sovereignty, that his betrayal is not a fluke or some type of cosmic accident, but it is God's plan being laid out. And we see sit there and go, well, how does that make sense? It may not make sense to us, but remember, God is always in the work of doing the bigger. Because ultimately, what is this betrayal going to lead to? It's going to lead to Jesus' death and resurrection, the ultimate example of a bigger healing, of a bigger hope, of a bigger life. And so Jesus is establishing his authority going, this is happening because I am allowing it. And yet, in a beautiful act of transparency, Jesus is honest and models that he is deeply troubled that he's going to be betrayed by a close friend. And this is a bit of a sidebar, but Jesus allows himself to feel. He allows himself to share this with his community. When we face trials of numerous kinds, we are allowed to feel those feelings and to wrestle with them as well. And so as we continue... 
verse 22, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. Would you underline or highlight that? At a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John, as identified as this way in chapter 21, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and asked him which one, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And so picture John kind of leaning back and some believe that really getting in close, almost putting his head on Jesus' chest and they're not having this conversation in a sense where everybody else can hear it. It's almost in whispers amongst the two of them. Verse 26, Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So again, let's stop right there and let's unpack this. And one of the things that we need to do is to be able to emotionally connect with what's going on, in particular with these disciples, we need to separate ourselves from the fact that we are walking into this knowing how the story ends. And what I mean by that is we have always been approaching the Bible as modern readers knowing that Judas is the traitor. You don't need to be in church long enough to understand Judas's role. In fact, you don't need to be in church at all to know Judas's role because in our common vernacular, that is a term of being a traitor, to be a Judas or acting like a Judas. And so we need to take a step back to connect with the disciples because Jesus is bluntly saying, one of you is going to betray me and their immediate response is not to think it's Judas. They don't know who it is and they are not suspecting that it's Judas. And again, this completely changes our paradigm because I don't know about you, but because I've always known that Judas is the traitor, I've always pictured that Judas looked like a villain in the story of Jesus. I've always pictured that Judas was like some melodrama villain with a cape and a top hat with his mustache and always hanging out in the corner away from them. But to the other disciples, he wasn't the villain. He was their brother. He was their partner. In fact, Judas was in charge of their money. He was the treasurer. You don't put the shady guy in charge of money. Because of that, he was likely the least one, the, the one that they would suspect the least. And so Jesus says that he's going to be betrayed. And Peter being Peter goes, hey, John, Jesus likes you. Ask him who it is. And I can only speculate, but I gotta wonder, did John's heart drop when it was revealed to him that it was Judas? Did it break, and what level of hurt was that? And so as we continue, in the middle of verse 27, so Jesus told him, he told Judas, what you are about to do, do quickly. And so again, under the authority of Jesus. What you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. Again, they didn't suspect him. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. And throughout John's gospel, he's painted this picture that Jesus and the kingdom of God is light and the opposition to Jesus is the dark, is the night. So it's very fitting for that comment to be there. And so now our scene is gonna shift a little bit to the second episode. Now that Judas has left, Jesus speaks to the remaining disciples about what's to come. And so in verse 31, when he was gone, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. Would you underline or highlight that? Now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the son in himself and will glorify him at once. Verse 33, my children. Would you underline or highlight that? What a beautifully intimate, an affectionate title that Jesus refers to his disciples at. But not only is it beautifully affectionate, 
but it's also a title of authority that as his children, he is our father and leader. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, referring back to chapter seven, I believe, so I, will t I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. And so let's stop right there. Jesus, throughout John's gospel, has spoken that his purpose, why he has come, is to bring glory to God the Father. To bring glory to God the Father means that the teachings, the acts, the miracle, the work of Jesus is to be a loud declaration of who God really is. So to bring glory to God the Father, Jesus is pointing and saying that God the Father is real, that God the Father is love, that God God the Father redeems, that God the Father is hope, that God the Father is mercy, that God the Father empowers. Jesus is now saying this in the context of looking at his death on the cross and to say that this is the ultimate moment of glorification because as Jesus dies on the cross, as Jesus will rise again three days later, it is the ultimate declaration of who God is, that the glory of God means that only God can bring life out of death, only God can can bring heaven out of hell. Only God can bring light where there was once dark. And Jesus the King is now saying that hour is now. And we can't go because that redemption can only be accomplished by the King himself. But in preparation for the aftermath of that, he then says this in verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Rocky Peak, for our purposes this weekend, these two verses are our heartbeat. So I'm going to invite you to put a giant box around them. I'm going to invite you to screenshot it, to take a picture of it, to put arrows around it, tabs, whatever draws your attention to it. I will read it again. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so here Jesus is beautifully telling us that the mark of the community of God, that the mark of the church, both the individuals and the collection of the individuals that we call the gathering of the church, that the mark of their heart, that the mark of the soul, that the mark of their life is the love of God in them and through them. And as we look at those passages, I want to in particular draw your attention to the word command. Who issues commands? Kings. Who is issuing this command? The king of kings. King Jesus. When a king issues a command, it is expected to be obeyed. This is a non-negotiable for us that claim the name of Jesus. And what is beautiful is understand the depth of where he's issuing this command. He is not saying, Christ followers, love is what you do. But this is King Jesus issuing this command directly into our hearts, our very identity, to say that as the the people of Jesus, this is now who you are. This is who Jesus has made you, has transformed you into. This is what the cross and the resurrection has brought. You are now defined at the core of your being by the love of God. And through that, we can now live in the overflow and love one another. Throughout the story of the gospels, we have seen that this is the message of the kingdom of God. We have seen repeatedly that Jesus is leading us to experience a radically bigger and a radically deeper love. We have seen King Jesus teach us, Christ followers, the most important thing we can do because of the love of God in you is to love God and love other people. We have seen Jesus teach us that because of the love of God in us, we can now love our neighbors when it's deserved and when it's undeserved. We have seen Jesus teach us the 
because of the love of God in us, we can now even, lead, even love our most heated of enemies. And now he is speaking specifically to the church. And he's saying, because of the love of God in you, what is now going to define you as the local community, as his disciples, is how you love one another. A new command I give you. And what is absolutely beautiful is that when he says new, it's not because this is a new teaching. You go back to the very early pages of the Old Testament and you see these commands to love, but now Jesus himself has modeled it. He has modeled a love that is not built on convenience. He has modeled a love that is not built on circumstances. He has modeled a love that is not built on emotion. He has modeled and he now empowers us to love the way that God loves us with an intentional and unconditional love. Because he washed the feet of his traitor. He loved the one who would lead him to his death. And so as we continue, verse 36, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Okay, we need to stop here. The first several times I was reading this over the last several weeks, I got really angry because I'm sitting there going, did you miss this? He doesn't refer to the command at all. What does he talk about? He's focused on what troubles him. He's focused on what is affecting his paradigm, what doesn't make sense to him. And I'm sitting there going, Peter, how are you missing this? The king just said, this is the new command and you're responding to what is bothering you. And then I had to pause and allow the Holy Spirit to humble me to realize I am Peter. We are Peter. We are guilty of this. That the Lord has said this is the command which is going to define us as individuals, as a community. And we often respond with, I often respond with, okay, I get it, but I'm really scared. I get it, but I'm really angry and they deserve it. I get it, but I don't want to be uncomfortable. I get it, but I have hopes. I have desires. I have plans. And hear me, those can be beautiful things and I don't want to minimize real, real pain, but we need to go back to the command that everything is rooted in loving one another. The king has issued a command and we are not to miss it. Because fear, anger, dashed hopes, trials, suffering, it will be transformed when we are rooted in his love for us and how we love one another. And so as we close out our passage, going back to verse 36, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later, which is a prophetic word on Peter's life. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, amen, amen. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And we'll cover that later. And I genuinely believe Peter in his sentiment. But looking at the entirety of the story together, we realize that for Peter to live out that declaration was going to require him to be rooted in a deeper love. And so that's our passage for this week in Rocky Peak. And so what I wanna do with the time that we have left is I wanna dig deeper into, the, into what this love is and how it's to define us as the church, both individually and collectively. But very much at the outset, we need to pause and gain ourselves a bigger perspective as to what is meant by church. We need a bigger paradigm. Because throughout your length of time in church, you probably have heard this phrase at some point, the church isn't a building, the church is the people. And as cliche as that sounds, we need to understand the truth and the magnitude of that. And so as we talk about this command to the church, we do need to acknowledge 
that the church is not this building, that the church is not a small group of elite leaders or, go- or, or scholars or spiritual superheroes, Christ followers. If you have given your life to Jesus, meaning you have experienced and acknowledged the King Jesus is real, if you have beautifully repented of your sins and experienced his forgiveness and mercy washing over you, if you have been invited to share in his kingdom by him, if you have been invited to experience his transformation, then what King Jesus has done is he has put his spirit in your life. Whether you've been walking with him for the entirety of your life or you've been walking with him for 15 minutes, when you came to know Jesus, he gave you his spirit, which is a declaration to the world around you, a declaration for all of eternity that you are now the church. And so hear me, you are the church as you sit here. And when you leave this place, you are still the church. You are the church in that parking lot. You are the church as you go about your days. You are the church in your highest of highs. You are the church in your deepest of sorrows. You, brothers and sisters, are the church. And so this command is not for an elite few. This beautiful command is for us all. And hear me. We cannot accomplish it without the work of Jesus in our hearts, and we cannot accomplish it without each other. And so as we dig deeper into what this means, we're gonna be intentionally using the word church, and we're talking about you. And so as we go into your note sheet, there's a section titled, What Defines Us? As I mentioned, that very first top, that top fill in the church, and our first, our first truth is the church is to live in Jesus' love. The church is to live in Jesus' love. To love others well begins in, internally in our hearts. We cannot give what we are not regularly experiencing in our own lives. And so the words of Jesus himself said, as I have loved you, Christ follower, are you regularly experiencing the truth that you are loved by King Jesus. Think about the magnitude of this love that before Jesus in our lives, you and I were defined by death. We were defined by darkness. We were defined by failure. We were defined by brokenness. We were defined by sin. And yet when we go back to John chapter three, we are told so beautifully that God so loved us that he sacrificed his one and only son so that whoever believes no longer experiences death, but experiences life, that experiences life that is brought to us through the love of God. If you think about when your journey with Jesus began, uh, many times, if you look at a room this size, our journeys are beautifully different. They involve different circumstances, different people, different mentors, different ways the spirit Spirit led us to the truth of Jesus, but we all are linked by the same foundation. We gave our lives to Jesus because we experienced how loved we are. And when we began our journey with Jesus, it was because we experienced that the love of Jesus rescues and forgives, that the love of Jesus transforms and empowers. And Christ followers, that was not designed to be a one-time experience. What you experience then is God's epic vision for your daily life. Just as it did, you still are redeemed and forgiven by the love of Jesus. You still are in empowered and transformed by the love of Jesus. Hear me, you are dearly, dearly loved children by Jesus the King. And with that comes spiritual warfare. 
And I always want to remind us of this whenever we bring up the enemy, is that the enemy is not God, and because of the resurrection of King Jesus, the enemy has been defeated. But the enemy is prowling, and he is still dangerous. And so the enemy knows that if you are experiencing God's love, that makes you dangerous to his plan. Because if you are a Christ follower that is regularly experiencing God's love, then you will be a reflection of that love. Then you will then treat people out of the overflow of that love. You will love others well, even in difficult circumstances, and the enemy can't have that. And so as a brilliant tactician, he will move to get us to stop thinking about God's love. He will move to try to separate us from that truth of God's love, to make it an occasional experience, not a daily experience as it was designed. Because if we stop regularly experiencing the love that Jesus has for us, then we begin to reflect what we experience the most. And that might be fear, that might be anger, that might be sorrow, that might be bitterness. And whatever we experience the most, whatever we reflect, that is how we will then treat others. And there's many ways that the enemy does this. But I want to highlight one in particular because it's been often a foothold I've given the enemy in my heart. And that's speed the pace at which we live life, the pace of running as hard as we possibly can until we absolutely collapse. There's not enough time ever, is there, to do the good as well as the bad. Sometimes our calendars are absolutely overwhelming. For many of us, the fact that if we can end the day not having drowned, we consider that a success. And in that, the enemy delights. You know why? Because we were designed to delight in the love of God and delighting takes time. Delighting requires pausing. Delighting requires enjoying. And so the enemy knows if he can get you, if he can get your families, if he can get you running, running, running past the point of exhaustion, if that becomes your regular rhythm, then you will run so fast that you will miss the truth of how loved you are. And so this command of Jesus is a call to our hearts to come back home and delight in how loved we are by Jesus the King. You know, I look at it this way. One of the most spiritual acts I can ever take part in is taking a deep breath. And there's nothing magical about that act. But the reason why that's often so powerful in my life is because it forces me to pause, even for a moment. See, beautifully, our bodies are designed to keep us breathing in the nor under normal circumstances. But to take a deep breath causes me to stop, causes me to slow down. It causes me to be intentional about taking in and taking out. And when I pause, even for a slight moment, I begin to see what I may have missed. And so I believe that this is a moment for us as a church to take a spiritual deep breath. And there in your note sheet, the apostle later on in the New Testament writes, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And so please hear this truth, brothers and sisters, that some of you this weekend are, run, are, are, are living at a good, manageable pace, and some of you are running so hard and so fast, you have no idea how to stop. Wherever you are, hear the words of King Jesus that you are deeply loved. Some of you this weekend are coming out of a season of joy, a season of laughter, a season of plenty, and some of you are joining us in a season of sorrow, a season of trial, a season of tears, and wherever you are, hear the words of King Jesus for you that you are deeply 
loved. Some of you are coming this weekend in a season of confidence in which you're feeling a confidence in your leadership, in your passions, in your gifts. And some of you are coming in in a season of discouragement, in a season of insecurity, in a season where you don't know your value and your worth. And hear the words of King Jesus to you. You are deeply loved. And as we take this breath together, I want to invite you to hear these words one last time. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And so Rocky Peak, it's a beautiful act we get to do together to pause and remember this, but this is not enough. This needs to become an act that defines our individual walks with the Lord. We have no shot of loving each other well unless we are experiencing the never-ending, the wild love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. And so I want to invite you to do something. At some point in the next 24 hours, I want to invite you to carve out some paused, unrushed time, 10, 15 minutes, to sit with this passage, to sit with this command, and rather than coming up with your own ideas on how you're gonna pause in your everyday rhythms, seek the Holy Spirit's leadership and allow him to lead you, to show you how to begin to do this. Of particular note, parents, I wanna invite you to seek the Holy Spirit for how you can model this for your families for your kids and have this be the foundation for you and your relationship with them. And this time of the Holy Spirit is gonna lead us into our second, our second truth. And so your second fill in there in your note sheets is the church is called to live out Jesus' love. And there in your note sheet, again, going back to 1 John, the apostle writes, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And I find it so beautiful that John is writing this 40, 50, maybe even 60 years after he first experienced that command from Jesus. And here he is, decades later, reminding, encouraging, empowering the early church that this is what defines us. As a people who have been loved greatly, we now have the opportunity. In other words, we now have the honor and the privilege to love others as we have been deeply loved. And if you think about the wondrous things that we often associate with church, if you think about going to church, if you think about giving to your church, if you think about serving your local church, those are beautiful things. But when we build them on the foundation of who we now are, we are a loved people who now love. Think about how it transforms all of those acts. Think about how it transforms attending Rocky Peak on the weekend when we experience, when we know we are doing so because we are loved and we have the opportunity to love others. Think of how it transforms our attitude towards giving of our time, of our resources, how it transforms how we serve to have it as our top priority that we do so because we have been loved and we now have the opportunity to love one another. And so again, we as the church are called to be known and defined by our love for one another. So how are we doing? That's kind of a tough question, huh? And if I'm honest, it kind of raises the jibblies in my stomach. But often when I hear that question, it often is spoken in an institutional sense. How's the local church? How's the Church of America? How's the global church doing? And there is good discussion that should be had in that. But I need to take a step back and ask a more piercing and a much more humbling question. I'm the church. And I'm not speaking as a pastor or a leader. I'm speaking as a fellow brother in Christ. I'm the church. And so as I look at the command of Jesus, it calls me to evaluate, am I known 
for loving others well. Rocky Peak, I want to invite you to reflect on that question. As Christ followers, are you known for loving others well? And please hear my heart. I understand that asking a question like that can raise uncomfortability and some tough emotions, but go with me on this journey because I believe that the Lord wants to do something beautiful in us. And as I began examining this question before the Lord, I began asking, in those seasons in which I am not loving people well, why is that? What are the barriers? What's the roadblock to me loving other people? And the Lord led me to a very simple yet profound truth. When I struggle at loving others well, it is because loving others well is hard. When I struggle at loving, it is because it is hard and it reveals the pride in my heart that I want love to be easy. In fact, the Holy Spirit took me a little bit deeper. It revealed that loving others the way Jesus loves me is hard and that is in direct conflict to a deeply held value in my heart that I want life to be easy. I want life to be comfortable. I don't want any barriers to my enjoyment or comfortability or whatever that may be. And I think many of us can relate that we, we put in a lot of effort, of time, of energy, of resources, trying to eliminate difficulties from our lives to make our lives easier. You know, let me illustrate it this way. You know, as a kid, I grew up in the era of blockbuster video. Did anybody live through the area of blockbuster video as well? I have many, many fond memories of blockbuster video in my childhood. If I wasn't home, I was likely at the blockbuster that used to be on Sepulveda and Devonshire over in Mission Hills. And I was thinking about this recently because on Netflix, there's a fabulous documentary called The Last Blockbuster. Did you know there's still one blockbuster standing? I want to say Bend, Oregon, somewhere there. And it was fun because it unpacks the history of blockbuster video. And it was fun reliving that era. But it was also interesting that I realized I don't miss that era. And you know why I don't miss it? Because it was hard. Think about it. If I want a movie today, I just need to pull out my phone. If we wanted to watch a movie through Blockbuster, it required work. First of all, you couldn't just walk into a Blockbuster and take things. You had to be a member. And you had to give them like a utility bill or something. You had to wait to get that plastic card before you could do things. Secondly, you physically had to go to Blockbuster. That is something that as I've tried to explain Blockbuster to my children, they don't understand. If my parents did not want to drive me, then I had to walk in that required work. Third, Blockbuster was emotionally difficult. <laughs> there is no crushing feeling quite like them not having the movie you wanted to watch on a Friday night. For those of you that know, you know what it was like spending all day thinking, hey, tonight I'm going to watch The Fugitive with Harrison Ford, only to get to Blockbuster and they're not having that cassette tape behind the cover and you're stuck watching Time Cop, which is not a good <laughs> trade-off at all. And I joke and I bring a little levity to the situation, but the reality is Rocky Peak. I don't want life to be hard. And that becomes one of the biggest barriers towards me loving others well. Because loving our brothers and sister is loving family. And as we all know, loving family is hard. And you know why loving family is hard, especially in a church context? Because we did not choose our family. Jesus chose us. And if you think about the original 12 disciples, they did not choose one another. And Jesus called disciples that were radically opposed from one another, that were heated enemies from one another to teach them how to love well. One of the things that makes it really hard to love our community well is the fact that we are beautifully different from one another. It's hard because we have different personalities. It's hard because we have different callings. We 
we have different passions. It's hard as we know full well over these last two years because we have different opinions and we have different viewpoints on passionate issues. Another reason why it's hard to love one another well is we are imperfect. That means our family is going to hurt us. And at times, that is going to be in slightly unknowing ways. In others, it's going to be deep in cutting ways. Another reason why it's hard is loving our community well requires our time. You can't love well without time. It requires our engagement. It requires our emotions. It requires our resources. It requires value. It requires our efforts as we go into it. And it pulls out the sin in my heart that I want an easy love. And I am grateful that our King Jesus will not settle for an easy love in our lives. Because an easy love is skin deep and Jesus wants more for you. Jesus wants more for our community. Jesus wants more for his kingdom. And the reason that we know he wants more is that he has given us his spirit. Rocky Peak, we cannot love others well on our own. It can only be accomplished through the power of King Jesus in us. And think about it. What did he say? By this, they will know that you are my disciples. What message does it declare to a world that does not yet believe in King Jesus to look at the church and see this motley group of imperfect people who are empowered by God's spirit in us and are choosing through that power to love one another, even though we are different, who are embracing that power to forgive one another when we are hurt, who is clinging to his resurrection power to bear with one another in our weaknesses, in our messiness, to be unified despite the radical differences we find ourselves having. What does that scream to the world that we can only do so under a supernatural power that is found in King Jesus and nowhere else? And I love how it's put there in your note sheet. Ideally, the church itself is not made up of natural friends. It is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of this sort. Christians come together because they have been loved by Jesus himself. They are a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. Rocky Peak, this is our command and this is our privilege to experience the love that King Jesus has for each and every one of us and to then supernaturally demonstrate that love for our community when it is deserved and when it is not. And so as I invited you to go before the Holy Spirit sometime in the next 24 hours with that, I want to invite you to ask him, King Jesus, open my eyes to how I can experience your love and through that, love my local church community. Love my brothers and sisters in the easy and in the hard, in the agree agreements and in the passionate disagreements, in the caring and in the hurts. Teach me to love as you currently love me. Amen? I'm gonna invite the worship team to come on out and as we're led into this final song of worship, I wanna invite you, Rocky Peak, to make this a declaration of love 
And specifically what I mean by that, make this a declaration of experiencing Jesus' immense love for you. Make this be a declaration in which we get to obey joyfully this command laid out for us, that we don't get to, we don't, are not called to do it isolated from one another, but we are doing it together as a local church body, that we are answering the invitation of King Jesus in our lives to be a reflection of his beauty, his power, and his grace. And so let me lead us in prayer as we go into that time. King Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your love that surpasses all understanding. We thank you for your love that is undeserved, that is full of grace and mercy. We thank you for your love that empowers us when the message of the enemy, when the message of the world is that we need to earn our value, we need to earn our worth. We thank you for our love that will never abandon us even when others have. We thank you for a love that forgives us even at our worst. We thank you for your love. And we thank you that because of that, as imperfect fallen human beings, we have the opportunity to love others in a powerful way. And so specifically, as we're called to love the local church, Jesus, work in our hearts, open our eyes to see opportunities to do so in simple ways, in profound ways. But let us be a people who do not ignore your command but let us be a people who joyfully are learning to obey our King. And just as you do, we have the opportunity to do as well. And we thank you for that privilege. And so as we sing together, Jesus, as I said, let this be a declaration of our hearts. And it's in your name, King Jesus, we all said, amen.